asking yourself whether you're wrong is a really good thing. If you really feel strong conviction that you're doing the right thing, then keep going. This is what happens when you work to change things. And first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Devastated uh, that we did not catch and fix these issues faster. Theranos trial is heating up. After three months, the prosecution rested its case today. And this afternoon, the defense made a huge splash calling Elizabeth Holmes to the stand. <laughs> Hello friend, welcome or welcome back to the channel for another video. My name is Carly Wharton and I am a budding evolutionary astrologer. Hmm, look at that. That's what we're doing here. We're smushing together two of my all-time favorite hobbies, studying astrology and human behavior. So we are going to look at some of the most inspirational leaders, cunning con, con, cunning con artists, money makers, rump shakers, and everything in between. If they did something cool or maybe not cool at all, then they are fair game for us to study on this channel in this series. So a couple of things. One, if you have an idea for a name for the series, holler at me because I don't. And two, anybody is fair game. So if there's somebody that you would like to see me cover, leave it in the comments and I will do my best. I can't promise it'll be next, but who knows? Maybe you have a better idea than I do. That's always possible. It seems the stars have aligned for me to start this series. First up is Elizabeth Holmes, who is currently on trial right now. So that makes this video right on time. If you don't know who Elizabeth Holmes is, don't worry, I'm going to tell you the whole story before we dive into her natal chart. A few years ago, she was best known worldwide for being the youngest ever female self-made billionaire. Quite an accomplishment. The youngest billionaire in the world. Mm -hmm. Is that heady when you hear that? You know, it's it's not what matters. Um, what matters is how well we do in trying to make people's lives better. I mean, that's that's why I'm doing this. That's why I work the way that I work, and that's why I love what I'm doing so much. Now she is probably best known for being on trial for fraud. So that's a lot of ground to cover in between, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. So ready or not, ever since I first heard of Elizabeth Holmes, I was fascinated by her personality, by her choices and her path and her vision and her drive. And honestly, if things hadn't unfolded the way they did these last couple years, I probably would be using her as one of my greatest role models. Last week, she became the youngest member ever named to the prestigious Horatio Alger Association, which recognizes grit and drive. You were the only woman up there with a lot of older white men. This is true. Yeah, I was. <laughs> but what was so wonderful about it is that these young girls who are in the audience Good morning. My name is Crystal Marichek. could connect uh, to me to as nothing but living proof that their dreams are possible. Whenever there is a quote unquote glass ceiling, there is an iron woman right behind it. <laughs> So it's very fun that she happens to be the first person that we're going to talk about. And honestly, I think her greatest life accomplishment so far is that her experience raises so many juicy questions to consider. Like, is it a crime to build a plane while you're flying it? Is it a crime to sell tickets to other people to get on that plane and tell them that it's a fully built plane, but it's really not? Is that a crime? I don't know. I didn't sign up to work in the legal system, so these really aren't my decisions to make. I more specialize in questions and contemplations. How much information do you owe to those private investors that are giving you their money, and with that money, you're bringing this business to life? Whether they want to invest in your business or not, that's up to them. Are lies of omissions really lies? 
Should you go to jail for lying? What if those lies of omission netted you a few hundred million dollars of somebody else's money? Should the investors that poured millions or hundreds of millions of dollars into Theranos, should they have done a greater level of due diligence? Is that victim blaming? Yeah. Elizabeth Ann Holmes was born February 3rd, 1984 in Washington, D.C. to a well-connected family. That is foreshadowing and will definitely come into play almost immediately. Her birth time is unknown, and when we get more into the astrology section, you'll see why that matters. In early life, she was a very ambitious little girl. Very, very ambitious. She was quoted as saying, I want to be a billionaire when I grow up. Well, you were pretty young when you decided you wanted to change the world. I mean, you put it in writing, didn't you? I did. I wrote a letter to my dad. I moved around all the time when I was growing up, and I told him that I was really excited. We were moving to Texas at the time because I thought Texas was big on science. I think this note said, what I really want out of life is to discover something new, something that mankind didn't know was possible to do. How old were you? Nine? I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> Who says that when they're nine years old? <laughs> I, I grew up in a family of people who wanted to make a difference in the world. Elizabeth's father is Christian Rasmus Holmes the fourth fancy and he was a vice president of Enron for a time as well as after that being a high-ranking official for several different government agencies so he's a real professional guy Elizabeth's mother Noel not a whole lot of information to be found on her. All I could find was before she got together with Elizabeth's dad, she was a campaign staffer and an aide in Washington, D.C. So not a lot to go on other than those definitely sound like way lower level positions than a VP of a gigantic company. So long story short, as she was growing up, Elizabeth had a thing for learning Mandarin. I couldn't really find where this passion of hers came from, but it definitely shaped her life in a really powerful way. Learning Mandarin is a thing because she ended up going to a summer program where that was the whole program, was to learn Mandarin. Also at the program, she met Ramesh Balwani, known as Sunny Balwani, and he was 37, she was 18. So, problematic, to say the least. This guy's Sunny? Really? The next year, Elizabeth went to Stanford. That was in 2002. She did one year at Stanford before deciding that she wanted to drop out to begin her company, which would later become Theranos. The original name was Real Time Cures, I believe. <laughs> So at 19, she drops out of Stanford to start her company, and she has more of an engineering background, and the product that she's wanting to invent is something that is completely revolutionizing the healthcare industry. It's a medical product used for blood testing. Instead of a needle to the arm, it's a pinprick to the finger. So how does it work? First, we've created these little tiny tubes, which we call the nanotainers, which are designed to replace the big traditional tubes mm -hmm. that come from your arm and instead allow for all the testing to be done from a tiny drop from a finger. It sounds genius, but what about those who say that's not enough blood to do all the tests that need to be done, especially if someone's very sick and you're trying to figure out what it is? Every time you create something new, there should be questions. and. To me, that's a sign that you've actually done something that uh, is transformative. So how she wrote herself that check of thinking that this was something that she could do, you can again see how dramatically ambitious she is. When she started her company, her, her main vision with revolutionizing the healthcare industry was to democratize healthcare. Those are her words. She wanted to make preventative healthcare 
available, accessible, affordable to everyone. It was no longer that you had to wait until you were sick with symptoms and that then they're catching the disease too late and there's no time to help the person heal. She famously quotes a story over and over and over again in her public speaking that she did towards the end, right before Theranos collapsed, where she says that the reason that she started Theranos was because she wanted the preventative testing to be available because her uncle died of cancer and by the time they found it, it was everywhere and she never got a chance to say goodbye. So that was her famous tagline was that no one would have to say goodbye too soon. So that has been famously her foundation for why she started Theranos to begin with. Again, this is foreshadowing for what's coming because apparently that's not at all what happened, but we'll get to that. This is also at 19 when she starts dating Sunny, the 37-year-old that she met the year before. As she gets Theranos up and running, this is where her well-connected family comes really quickly back into the picture because not only did her parents have the money that they were planning to spend on her Stanford education to give her, but they also had lots of friends that were venture capitalists. How convenient. And those people also gave her large sums of money. It is interesting to note that one of those first investors is Tim Draper, and that is the father of her childhood friend. So this was like growing up in Washington, D.C. And this guy, Tim, he, Mr. Draper, basically is defending everything that she's done. By 2004, Elizabeth had raised $6 million from these people that were connected to her family. Later in 2005, Sunny and Elizabeth begin living together. So if you're tracking on the math at this point, she's 22, right? 22. Yes, 22. And so this is where things definitely start to spice up. So in November of 2006, this is where the CFO, Henry Mosley, was fired after questioning the reliability of Theranos and its technology. He raised these concerns and questions to Elizabeth directly and basically was terminated as a result. That would be the last time that Theranos would have a CFO. She pretty much took it under her wing from there. She thought, you know what? Who needs a professional when there's me to wear all the hats of all the things? We all know how well that turned out. A few years later, in 2009, Sunny joins Theranos officially into the company as its president and COO, or chief operating officer. At this point, no one inside Theranos knew that Elizabeth and Sunny were in a romantic relationship, and that would not become public knowledge for many years after Sunny joined the company. So as you can see, we've made it almost 10 years into the business, and there isn't a whole lot known about those early years. If you watch the documentaries, uh, either The Inventor or the book Bad Blood, then we do know a little bit about the way the technology was unfolding at that point, but Elizabeth herself was not engaging with the public like at all until September of 2013. It was right around this time that they revealed that they had partnered with Walgreens to put in wellness centers nationwide. Obviously, they were going to roll it out in a small number of stores first and eventually expand, and they ended up being in that partnership with Walgreens for seven years. So fast forward about a year later, this is really when the media attention came in full force, when Elizabeth was named one of the richest women in America by Forbes magazine. This made her the youngest female self-made billionaire to have ever lived. It's important to note that She earned that title because Theranos, her company that she owned 18 and a half million shares of, had been valued at either 9 to 10 to 11 billion dollars. It's a lot. And she owned 18 and a half million shares. It must be around 50% because that made her worth four and a half billion dollars. Not in cash money, in her ownership stake in Theranos, this technology that she had created. Again, foreshadowing. By December of 2014, Theranos had raised $400 million in capital investments. And so you think about the valuation, the $9 billion, let's say, valuation on a $400 million investment, 
that valuation obviously factors in that the technology was working exactly as Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes, and her team were presenting it to be. A few months later, July of 2015, this is a big parade day for Theranos because they received FDA approval on their herpes test. Mind you, they had a menu of 200 some blood tests that their equipment could run, and the FDA is now approving of this one test. That is the only test that ever got approved by the FDA. Uh, whoops. So at this point, Elizabeth is about 13 years into building Theranos, the company, the technology, the partnerships, the investors, and this is the end of the rise. <laughs> so I'll see you in the fall. Along the way, Elizabeth built up a board of directors that was probably the most star-studded board of directors that ever existed. You can Google Theranos board of directors and see more. The main thing that she recruited for was political power and clout. Nowhere on the original board were there medical professionals or chemists or any kind of healthcare people. They were just absent. Again, Elizabeth she had it under control. So the beginning of the end came in August of 2015 when the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, began investigations of Theranos. It was only a couple months later in October when John Carreyrou famously now published his very first Wall Street Journal article exposing the technical difficulties that Theranos was having with their equipment and how much of the time they were having to rely on standard industry equipment instead of using their own proprietary devices and methods. Theranos, of course, fully denies what was included in the article. However, thanks to the article, Theranos officially created a medical advisory board for their company, their healthcare company. My only question is why was this not already a thing? You know, food for thought. In November, this is when Safeway, the grocery store chain, pulls out of the $350 million partnership they had established with Theranos prior to Theranos services being offered in any of Safeway's stores. Coming into the beginning of 2016, it's starting to get hot. The Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, or CMS, send a letter to Theranos and give them 10 days to correct the issues in their California laboratory. That was the only lab at the time that was performing tests for the public. In in May of 2016, Sonny Balwani, Elizabeth's boyfriend and the president and COO of the company, leaves Theranos. Now, how he came to leave is completely debatable, apparently, because Elizabeth says that she forced him out because he's a baddie and he was doing it. And Sonny says that he left on his own accord. So who knows? Sonny and Elizabeth, they know. They know exactly what happened and they're not telling or one of them's not telling. Anyways, June of 2016 definitely sucked for Elizabeth Holmes. Forbes corrected her net worth. Forbes, Forbes took it a little personally that they had like launched her into the stratosphere, all of this on the cover and like really got behind the Elizabeth Holmes train. So they corrected her net worth from four and a half billion dollars to zero. Also that month, Walgreens officially ended the partnership with Theranos, closing all 40 of the Theranos wellness centers that they had already built in their stores. In July, that CMS letter that they got way back when telling them to fix the issues in their lab, they got their lab shut down. And Elizabeth was actually banned from owning or operating a medical lab for two years. So that was how they put kind of a cease and assist on them real quick. Actually, that's like no more than a slap on the wrist because that lab was doing testing for Walgreens, which had already jumped ship, and Safeway was gonna be having testing done there, but again, already jumped ship. So at that point, being told that you can't operate a lab is like a slap on the wrist. So in August of 2016, a month after they get their lab shut down, Elizabeth, the crafty little minx that she is, pivots to the mini lab. This is a device that does the testing for the person, whoever owns the mini lab. So instead of performing tests in their labs for the public, for these wellness centers for Walgreens, she's now offering the mini lab to sell to facilities to use themselves. So no in-house testing for the public required, and the CMS ban did not specifically prevent R&D. 
So they can still run lab tests as long as it's for developing their own machinery like the mini lab. Kudos, kudos, Elizabeth. Shortly after, in October, the first investor comes for them and they want their $96 million back, please. This was also the month that they had their first layoff of 340 employees. Was along then until November when Walgreens sued them. They also would like their money back, please, to the tune of about $140 million. So I got to think most of that money is long gone. So I don't know how much money they had to repay investors at the end. Don't know. If you find it, leave it in the comments. Between that being settled, just a couple months later then in January of 2017, they laid off another 155 employees. At this point, there's like a couple dozen people left, and those were the people that were there to close the books on Theranos. In April, Elizabeth settles. This, this makes me laugh because it's funny. Uh, Elizabeth settles with CMS, the, the Medicaid and Medicare people. Uh, she pays a fine of $30,000 which after all the hundreds of millions of dollars for her to get a $30,000 fine is just ridiculous. And she, again, is not allowed to own a lab. And at that point, yeah, there is no lab. There's no technology. Again, no, no real consequences have been faced just yet. This is where I get to tell you that in 2017, so this is about a year after she broke up with Sonny and kicked him out of the company, so she says, she starts dating a guy named Billy Evans, who just happens to be the heir of a hotel chain in California. Uh, he's 27 years old at the time. So just in time for March 14th of 2018, when Elizabeth and Sonny are both charged with massive fraud by the U.S. government. The actual charges are nine counts of wire fraud and two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. This is a direct quote. The SEC charges Holmes and Balwani with a massive fraud involving more than $700 million from investors through an elaborate years-long fraud in which they exaggerated or made false statements about the company's technology, business, and financial performance. So that is right from what they got charged with. So as a result of these charges, uh, Elizabeth gives up most of her stake in the company, meaning her 18 and a half million shares of ownership. Yeah, she surrendered most of those. A couple months later in May, May of 2018, John Kerry Rue's book, Bad Blood, comes out. So he partnered with his own investigation, partnered with the whistleblowers from Theranos, who actually ended up being what brought it all to light. Meanwhile, the government's investigations have been going on. Lab inspections, more regular auditing, and it's not going well. They're not passing these inspections. Randomly, a month after the book comes out, Elizabeth all of a sudden announces that she is stepping down as the CEO of Theranos. Weird. Couple minutes later, it's made public that the federal grand jury has officially indicted Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Belwani. At that time, the Theranos lead counsel takes over as CEO and basically proceeds to dissolve the company. In March of 2019, The Inventor documentary airs on HBO. Highly recommend. It was very good. And also in 2019, Elizabeth and Billy get married. So they're married now. Very happy for them. Then in May of 2020, they managed to find one more charge of wire fraud. So they add that to the pile. Then in September, this is when we first catch a glimpse of how Elizabeth plans to defend herself at trial. And I gotta say, this is like a real turning point for me personally personally, in my opinion of her and this case in general, how she behaved at Theranos. Obviously, I wasn't there, and I can't say that she didn't do things bad or wrong, but back then, she was so passionate about her vision and like the quote that I used at the beginning, where if you have strong conviction about something, then keep going. And that Elizabeth Holmes, honestly, I can get on board with. This Elizabeth Holmes that in this very first glimpse that we see of her defense, she is going for mental disease. And apparently that theory didn't hold enough water because that's not what she came out with at trial here just recently. <sighs> but that already tells you that she's trying to get out of it. She's trying to slip out from under the consequences of what she did. And 
Honestly, I, at this point, I would have so much more respect for her if she had just stuck with, I believed in my vision. I believe in my vision. Like, like the way she's going now, it almost makes it sound like, did you even really care about blood testing stuff? Like, if it was all just Sunny making you do stuff. Oh, I guess I haven't. I guess I haven't gotten to that part yet. <laughs> Okay, so this is all in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that is why her trial was delayed and then delayed again due to the pandemic. It was supposed to start July of 2021. And in May of 2021, we get the bombshell news that sister's pregnant. She's going to have a baby in July. So if we could not start the trial just then, that'd be really great. So they bumped it to August, (laughs) which I guess they weren't too happy about. So anyway, so in August of 2021, this is where we get to see through unsealed court documents that Elizabeth's defense is actually that Sonny made me do it, basically, that he was controlling and that they had a 15-year abusive relationship where he controlled what she ate and what she wore and all of these things. This is where the story gets into territory that I'm going to share my pair of pennies with y'all just to give you some food for thought, but I am also going to do my best to stay out of what's not my business. You know, I read one article that it really went through, like, do we believe her? Do we believe her by default that like she's an abuse victim? And if so, what does that do? What does that do to her trial? What does that do to his trial? And based on the Elizabeth Holmes that we knew back when she was running things and was happy to be on the cover of every single magazine, giving all the public speaking things, all the TED Talks, all the everything, you're telling me she was a puppet on a string? Because I'm sorry, but I don't buy that. Like that, that it just doesn't make sense. But at the same time, how can you just say like, "Mm, that didn't happen? Like you can't. So I'm not going to. But as especially as we get into her astrology, I just like, I can't really believe that Sonny made me do it. Like, I, I, no, I don't think so. It was because of these allegations from Elizabeth to Sonny that he was abusive to her that they ended up deciding to split the trial. So that's why Elizabeth is on trial right now. And when her trial is over, Sonny's is scheduled to start in early of 2022. So also in August, we, we, I talk like I was there. They began jury selection for the Elizabeth Holmes trial. And then on September 8th, the trial officially began. The prosecution mounted their case for almost three months, bringing witness after witness of investors that she defrauded or patients and, you know, just complications after complications. Then they finally rest their case and it's now the defense's turn to rebut everything that they just landed on them. And so they called Elizabeth. She's going on the stand. And that means that, yes, her defense team, her lawyers get to question her as softly and nicely as they want. And they can prepare and rehearse and advance and get it all ironed out and paint whatever picture they want for the jury. The way they did it was just so, it was so clever is what it was. And again, as we get into Elizabeth's astrology, I'm going to ask you to think about like how, however many layers you think she's working on, triple it at least. And that is what's going on inside her mind. The way they did it right before the weekend on a Friday, the last hour of court, they call her to the stand. So the jurors got to see like an hour of friendly, smiley Elizabeth Holmes and so personable and like just connecting and making eye contact. And then the jurors go home for their weekend, come back on Monday, same thing, more friendly, nice, smiley testimony. And then the third day was Tuesday, right before Thanksgiving. And she was basically fighting back tears on the stand at multiple times, which that level of emotional display, again, we'll get into her astrology. I wonder if she's really capable of genuine emotional display like that in terms of the vulnerability that it genuinely requires to let your real time current emotions come through. She isn't built like that. She is built for masterful self-control. And that is what we have always seen from her until 
she's got a story to tell. about the abuse that she suffered from Sunny, and she, this is her testimony from the stand, she claims that she was raped in her one year at Stanford, and that that is actually why she poured herself into creating Theranos, which again, if you go back to the story that she told about her uncle, you know, I'm, I'm multi-passionate myself, so not to say that somebody couldn't have multiple sources of inspiration that all came together but again it's just like do you believe her and if so what does what does that you know like this is such like dangerous territory like i don't want to discredit her experience at all and if that really happened to her like i feel horribly for anybody that is on the receiving end of any kind of abuse. So you hate to say that it just didn't happen, but you got to wonder, again, going back to her astrology, which we're going to dive deep into here just in a minute, like how does it benefit her to paint herself in this light? How does it benefit her to break down emotionally on the stand? How does that play to the perception? that people have of her, it serves her well, along with the husband, along with the baby, along with walking in, holding your mom's hand every day for court, like she's a (laughs) five-year-old. I could go on and on about how, how good this woman is at getting you to see what she wants you to see. That is a superpower. I'm not throwing shade at her at all whatsoever. I admire the depth of her ability to be clever and shape shifty and mold herself into whatever she needs to be to survive. Only time will tell what she does next with her life, whether she gets the 20 years in prison or she goes free. She's only like 37, 38 years old. So, I mean, we're going to get to see what she does next and time will tell. This is Elizabeth Holmes' natal chart. You'll notice it does not have any houses because her birth time is unknown. The unknown birth time also throws a monkey wrench in things when it comes to her moon sign. If you don't know the birth time, it automatically assumes that your birth time is noon just for the sake of it does need a time for casting the exact chart. So this moon being at two degrees of Pisces at noon means you change the chart to say, what if she was born at 12.01 a.m.? It does move her moon back into Aquarius, and it doesn't move to Pisces for several hours into the day on February 3rd. So without her birth time, we can't definitively say if her moon is in Aquarius or Pisces. So for simplicity's sake, we'll just use the noon on February 3rd, 1984 birth chart for Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, She was born in Washington, D.C., so you can cast this chart yourself if you would like and play around with it all you want. So at first glance, it's easy to see that she has a really heavy concentration of planets in just a handful of signs. So she's got three planets in Scorpio, two things in Sagittarius, four in Capricorn, Sun in Aquarius, Moon either in Aquarius or Pisces like we just saw, Chiron in Taurus, and North Node in Gemini. To unpack the complex personality that is Elizabeth Holmes, we're going to take this sign by sign and understand the multiple facets of the way that her unique energy is wired. We are going to take Elizabeth Holmes chart one thing at a time, one step at a time, and try to cover the whole thing here in like 20, 30 minutes. So good luck to me. The first piece I'll start with, typically any chart, we're going to start with the big three. So the Aquarius sun makes total sense to me in terms of her being a visionary, 
her wanting to be completely unique, to do something that the world had never seen before. There are other markers in her chart that also point to reinforcing that need to do something that the world has never seen before. This is also though where we start to see like, is she really wired for being in the kind of relationship she says that she had with Sonny Balwani, where he was totally abusive and calling all the shots and that that's why she shouldn't be found guilty of all these charges of fraud against her is because he was the one pulling the string and an Aquarius son like your evolutionary directive is to figure out who are you compared to what is the version of you that you were taught you should be and who have you been conditioned to be who is the real you compared to the conditioned you and figuring out which half is which, and maybe he is part of an elaborate period of conditioning in her life. I mean, the age fits, maybe that's what it was, but her whole self, just like the sun is the center of the universe, the sun in our natal chart is the center of our personality. So her entire personality is revolving around this Aquarius spirit of independent authenticity. So to then go back and say, I spent 15 years under the thumb of this guy, suspicious. Aquarius Sun is really about following your own personal path and that really like one of your superpowers is that you're not fooled by other people who just want to dominate or control or manipulate you. So again, I don't say this to like directly discredit her, but it doesn't make sense to me. Last thing I'll add on Aquarius sons is that they often admire people who were known through history as rebels or even criminals who stepped outside the lines because they too want to do something that the world has never seen before. To come forward as an individual soul and be different than anything the collective includes. That is very much the point of having an Aquarius sun. So the moon in her chart. So I'm going to give you an analysis of what if her moon was in Aquarius, and then I'm going to give you analysis of what if her moon was in Pisces. And that way you can draw your own conclusions and I'll also share mine just in case you're interested. The moon in Aquarius, and see, I think they both make sense. So it's hard to say what it is exactly, but it's also interesting to point out that it, even if her moon is in Aquarius or if it's in Pisces, it is still heavily aspected and talking to a lot of the other planets in her chart, which those aspects, they're there whether it's one sign or the other. So yeah, hard to say exactly which sign is right for her moon. But when you have an Aquarius moon, you want to, like everything in you, your emotional need, which is what the moon represents, is about aligning your biographical life with what you feel in your spirit, with the promptings of your own heart, your own inspiration. Your tools that you naturally possess with an Aquarius moon is that you're very skeptical of groupthink or of the status quo, or like, well, everybody knows that, you know, well, an Aquarius moon does not know that, and they're a little offended that you would even even say that they, they know the same thing as everybody else. They're unique, and they will find a way outside of society. Just like the Aquarius sun, Aquarius moon is irreverent, rebellious, innovative, and fiercely independent. Okay, so then on the other side of that, if the moon was in Pisces, this is, so I'll tell you right now, like I think her moon is in Pisces. And someday I really hope that we're going to find out what time she was born because I really would like to know. But the moon in Pisces makes sense to me because, and go with me for a second, because on the surface it's not going to look like it, but I promise it will eventually. With a Pisces moon, your first and foremost concern in life is prioritizing your own spiritual path. And it might be really easy to look at Elizabeth Holmes and say, she's not spiritual. She's a business lady. What are you talking about? Why does that make sense? Well, the ruler of Neptune, sorry, hmm, Pisces, the ruler of Pisces is Neptune. So to understand like what is her spiritual path, we have to go look at her Neptune. And her Neptune is at zero degrees of Capricorn. So her spiritual path is actually linked with her Capricorn energy. With the Pisces moon, it's like you put the call of your spirit above everything else. And 
Also, when you're talking about Pisces, there's escapist shadows, there's numbing of things that don't feel good, there's basically being full-on delusional, living in your own reality, which again, I think sounds like a superpower, but if you're going to use it like to not be accountable and to do bad things to other people, yeah, that obviously sucks. A Pisces moon also gives you exaggerated sensitivity at every level. And with the emotional connections that she made with her investors and mostly her investors, sounds like she wasn't a very nice boss to work for, but those emotional connections that had people giving her hundreds of millions of dollars, I got to think that that's the Pisces moon being extra sensitive. Like we'll see, like obviously that's not her only water energy. She's got a lot going on in Scorpio, which gives her insane psychic abilities to read other people and adjust herself to meet whatever strategic ends she might deem to desire. Obviously, girl got skills, but the Pisces moon makes sense in terms of that would at least give us a tiny bit of possibility that maybe Sunny really did slip into a power position with her because Pisces would be way more likely to be submissive towards a power figure than Aquarius questions authority at every turn. So again, the Aquarius energy being under anybody's thumb, that just doesn't really make sense to me. But if her moon was in Pisces, that might make a little more sense where she she saw what she wanted to see. She was so in her vision and like living her vision that reality snuck up and bit her on the ass. So again, we'll draw our own conclusions, moon in Aquarius, moon in Pisces, but them's my thoughts. Okay, so we've already foreshadowed to her Scorpio energy and her Capricorn energy. We're going to go to Scorpio first. Uh, She has three planets in Scorpio, Pluto, Mars, and Saturn. Any one any one of these Scorpio planets would give her radical psychic abilities in terms of reading other people's energy, in terms of self-control, in terms of presenting yourself in a way where other people see you the way that you want to be seen. Scorpio is like a mirror where you think that you're looking at them but really they are projecting something of an illusion back to you where you think you're looking at them, but all you're seeing, all you're getting is the illusion that they're giving you. And if you've seen Elizabeth Holmes, like gigantic eyes, I think that's what they're doing. It's almost like the, like the olden days, like the hypnotizing eyes where that is what she's doing. Like Scorpio energy as a skill is about compartmentalization, is about like the ability to be in total control of your emotions, to be in like really, really, really intense emotional situations and just look it dead in the face. Like, yeah, what else? What else is next? Um, And if you look at her, like she has exhibited extreme grace under pressure in terms of her career and the different opportunities that she had before Theranos fell apart. And then even while it was falling apart, she was still doing media coverage, denying everything and like looking as composed as ever. For the last few years, Theranos has been viewed as a revolutionary company. CEO has been uh, held as next Steve Jobs. Company has been valued as much as $9 billion in its most recent round of fundraising. But Theranos also has its critics, and just this morning, the Wall Street Journal ran a pretty scathing article about the company, alleging that the company's proprietary testing devices may be inaccurate, and basically accusing Theranos of deceptive practices. The journal cites a former employee who claimed that of the 240 tests offered by Theranos, only 15 are actually performed on the company's proprietary Edison diagnostic machine, the vast majority of the rest being done on traditional lab equipment. The article was pretty brutal. But here on Mad Money, we know something. We know that there are two sides to every single story, which is why I think it's important that we speak to Elizabeth Holmes, the founder and CEO of Theranos, who's coming to us this afternoon from Boston, where she's attending a meeting of the Board of Fellows at Harvard Medical School to give her a chance to answer the charges raised in the article. Ms. Holmes, welcome back to Mad Money. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I have to tell you, in all my years, I can't recall a private company that I have to candidly many have never heard of getting this kind of attention and scrutiny. What do you think is going on here? This is what happens when you work to change things. And 
first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. And um, I, I have to say, I, I, I personally was shocked to see that the journal would publish something like this when we had sent them over a thousand pages of documentation demonstrating that the statements in their piece were false. But um, but we're doing things differently, and we're working to make a difference, and that means people raise questions, and, and that's okay. Uh, but in this case, it was pretty disappointing to see that after every single one of the sources that we spoke with, who the journal had contacted, told us that the statements that were being attributed to them were false or misleading, and the only sources who were left were ones who wouldn't speak with us, who on their own website say that they now do business with LabCorp in their office or, in the other case, demanded in writing that we pay them in cash up front $2,500 for an hour to talk to them about their statements did, to the journal. Did the journal those know things what you just said? Did the journal know everything that you just said before they wrote the article? Uh, of, of course, absolutely. So her ability to put on the mask that she wants you to see is very scorpionic. And again, that level of ability to contort one's own, like it's not even just her appearance, it's her overall energy and demeanor. Like she can almost manipulate her own aura. So like as she's in court, like testifying in front of the jury, she is putting off an image of wife and mother and like just like walk into the courtroom every day holding your mommy's hand because couldn't possibly walk in here alone. And meanwhile, she got $700 million invested in her company in like 13 years, like first youngest woman ever in the history to do what she did. And yeah, now she's playing the victim. And that's also very Pisces moon, no offense to any Pisces moons out there, but the shadow of that Pisces energy is seeing yourself confined by the world, like by the actions and restrictions of everybody else. It's all their fault. It's not my fault. So I'll run through her placements in Scorpio real quick. So first, like early in Scorpio, she's got Pluto because she's at the very beginning of that Pluto and Scorpio generation. Pluto is a generational planet, meaning it moves really slowly. So her being born February of 1984, she is on the very front end of this Pluto and Scorpio generation. Pluto signifies in our natal chart where our soul came forward to incarnate. Our soul had a specific soul wound that it wanted to heal, something that had happened in a past life that didn't sit well with your soul, and you decided to come back and do it again. Basically, as I understand it, and I am part of this Pluto and Scorpio generation, so I feel like I've wrestled with a little bit of this myself, and if you're born during that time, you probably have too. Basically, Pluto and Scorpio signifies that your soul has experienced some of the worst that human experience has to offer in past lifetimes. So you saw the worst of the worst. And because of that, you have a wound when it comes to trusting other people. So Pluto and Scorpio, it signifies that you were betrayed. Like basically it's like you got proven to you in a past lifetime that good guys don't always win. So now you're back and you're here ready to try again. Try to build trust in other people. Try to find where your true power really comes from, not other people, hint, hint. It's a very painful and powerful process of healing. It's like that pain that we got in past lifetimes that was so awful, it came as a result of sticking our head in the sand and ignoring what was going on and ignoring our truth, ignoring the truth of the situation, just like getting along. And Pluto and Scorpio as a generation is here to prioritize the truth over getting along, right? The truth is what will set you free, not playing nice and playing politics with everybody else. So Pluto and Scorpio, it means not ever denying your own personal truth. You can't deny your own personal truth and be happy at the same time with Pluto and Scorpio. Probably true of most placements, but you know, I digress. That's a video for another day. Basically, Pluto and Scorpio generation is here to look the devil straight in the eye.
every single thing that is taboo in this world, Pluto and Scorpio generation is here to put it out in the light so that we can all agree once and for all that there is nothing that's taboo or off limits ever. Like we should all just be allowed to talk about anything we want. That's my vote. Anyway, with Pluto and Scorpio, if you do it right, you wind up with an expanded capacity to hold light in your being. You wind up with a trust and a faith that is as strong as source energy itself because you've literally walked through the darkest valleys and come out to the light on the other side. Next we have her Mars. Mars happens to be the classic ruler of Scorpio back in the day before Pluto was discovered. Pluto is now the ruler of Scorpio, so that's why Pluto and Scorpio is that much more powerful. But Mars in Scorpio gives a passionate intensity. Mars is now the ruler of Aries, which is a fire sign, and Scorpio obviously is a water sign, but is known for being the most intense out of all the water signs. And then you put Mars in Scorpio and it's like mm, that much more. So it's a very intense placement. And Mars also represents our masculine energy, our drive to go forth into the world and manifest our self, whatever that is, whatever that looks like. And so again, when you put Mars in Scorpio, it basically means that you were built for intensity. It gives you a radical emotional intelligence and signifies that you're here to do deep shadow work in this life, meaning facing your own truth, no matter how comfortable that is for you, comfortable or uncomfortable that is for you. And honestly, like the way to roll with Mars and Scorpio energy is to find a circle of people who not only accepts, but celebrates your intensity because there's no turning it off. Like that Mars and Scorpio, it's an inner fire that cannot be put out. It cannot be extinguished. The shadow though of Mars and Scorpio, I think fits her pretty well. It leads to being blunt, direct, overly direct or harsh and can leave you feeling isolated, resentful, and even depressed if you're not able to like face your inner truth. If you're trying to edit down your consciousness, that is like holding a part of yourself away from yourself and it's going to be impossible possible to live a happy life under those circumstances. Last but not least, her Saturn is in Scorpio. So she has this this obsession with Steve Jobs. And it's safe to say that I think it's been very well proven at this point that she's obsessed. And it's interesting because when you look at Steve Jobs' natal chart compared to Elizabeth Holmes' natal chart, they have a couple placements in common, and one of them is the Saturn in Scorpio. So Saturn is our soul's commitment to doing our homework, like learning what we came here to learn in this lifetime. Uh, Saturn is a very serious placement, very serious about doing the work that we came forward to do, whatever mission that was. Wherever your Saturn is located, that's going to color how you go about doing your work. And this is where I think it's very interesting, especially compared to Steve Jobs, where Elizabeth Holmes is known for being so secretive and so with Steve Jobs. This placement right here, I feel like explains that completely where Scorpio is so secretive and hidden away from the world. Like we talked about, they you see what they want you to see. You don't ever see the real them. Very, very rarely would you ever see the real them. Probably you would be more likely to see them physically naked than emotionally naked. Emotionally naked would take some time. This Saturn in Scorpio is another piece that gives you an innate ability for psychological work. And again, this is at the same thing that Steve Jobs had going on where he was a brilliant salesperson. And so was she, I mean, to the tune of $700 million. So that ability to connect with other people, to read their energy and then update your display, you know, give them the, the googly eyes so that they see whatever it is that you want them to see. And what people saw was a trustworthy, innovative, brilliant entrepreneur who was going to change the world. And I genuinely believe that she thought she could. But the Saturn in Scorpio, it's a fearless pursuit of the truth. So again, here is the third placement of hers in Scorpio where she is by design for her soul's evolution 
required to look at her own inner truth. And I'll just leave it right there as far as like, I feel like that that's pretty clear on why I don't think that it's wise, this defense that she is mounting as far as like, Sunny made me do it. And, you know, I was raped back in the day and that's why I started the company. How that gets you off the hook for fraud, I don't know. It's impossible for me to say what really happened, but I personally don't think that she like woke up in the morning and was like, I wonder how many millions of dollars I can defraud people for. I think she legit thought she was going to make that machine and it would revolutionize blood testing in the whole world and that she would go down in the history books for being the one who did it. And that part (laughs) leads us right on into her Capricorn energy. So as you can see, she's got four planets in Capricorn. She's got Neptune at zero degrees, Jupiter, Venus, and Mercury. And if you guys just want to see a Capricorn stellium in action, I present you this. Let me ask a little bit about you. Do you own a TV? No. (laughs) Why not? (laughs) I work all the time. (laughs) And um, I'm basically in the office from the time I wake up and then working until I go to sleep every day. So we'll just take it right across the top. We'll start with Neptune at zero degrees of Capricorn. This is another generational planet, meaning it spends years in each sign before moving on to the next one. Specifically, Neptune was in Capricorn from January 18th, 1984 to November 27th, 1998. That means that she was only born a couple weeks after Neptune entered Capricorn. So she is on the very front of this Neptune and Capricorn generation, which I am also a part of and resonate strongly with. Neptune is our spiritual path. It is our unique path to developing spiritually. That means whatever sign your Neptune is in, in this case Capricorn, those are the energies that you have to engage with to live out your own spiritual development. So the Neptune and Capricorn generation, we are business builders, basically. And by doing that, by building our own businesses, we are going through a phase of spiritual development as a soul. It doesn't have to be in a church or like in a yoga retreat halfway around the world. It can be anything that fits with whatever sign your Neptune is in. That's how you connect to your spirit. So going back to our moon conversation where, you know, if her moon was in Pisces, that means her spiritual path is the most important thing to her. And her Neptune, which shows you where her spiritual path is, is in Capricorn, where Capricorn is our great work that we came to leave in this world. It is our ability to work hard. It is our ability to have self-discipline. It is our ability to maybe make ourselves do things that we don't necessarily want to do, but we're going to do it in pursuit of the bigger vision that we are working towards. Neptune and Capricorn as a generation is known for having fantasies of wealth and empires. (laughs) This is like the generation that they don't just want to build a business, they want an empire. So, but again, it's not, it's not for nothing. Like building that empire, the act of doing it, the journey that that takes you on is the spiritual development journey that these souls are after. And if you aren't adequately leaning into your Neptune and Capricorn energy, meaning following your spiritual path through Capricorn, it leads to feelings of defeat, like everything is unfairly stacked against you and that there was never any possibility of you winning. You basically envision the world around you as a prison that's holding you back and eventually you give up. And I highlighted this line because of my beliefs around law of attraction. Um, This made a lot of sense for, you know, the fact that she was envisioning her life as a prison. She felt the walls like literally closing in on her. And then they did. (laughs) And now she's facing actual time in prison. It just seemed a little bit too close of a coincidence not to point out. The next thing she has in Capricorn is Jupiter. Jupiter spends about a year per sign. So it being so close to the beginning of Capricorn, it only just got there when she was born. The prize, if you do your Jupiter correctly, Jupiter is known for expansion and blessings and mostly opportunities for expansion. Anywho, if you engage your Jupiter in Capricorn correctly, you get dignity, self-respect, and the actual accolades that come along with being a very accomplished person and made Holmes the world's youngest female self-made billionaire 
basically the universe has challenged you, show us something excellent. It also signals that your evolutionary intent is to leave behind something that outlives you. So your legacy in this world is basically everything to you with this placement. It also, because we're talking about Jupiter and it's large and expansive, it expands all of those Capricornian themes of self-discipline and self-respect. And actually one of the shadows of Jupiter and Capricorn is that it can lead you to overestimate your own valuation. Capricorn by nature is extremely resourceful like one of the most resourceful signs there is. And yet you can believe that you're too good. You know, I think that's what led her to not have a medical board in her medical company <laughs> until she basically was, it was like too late at that point to add it on. But she did it anyway. You got to give her props for that. The gift from the gods of Jupiter in Capricorn is that you can keep your eye on the prize long after other people have gotten distracted and moved on to something else. For you to really get, you know, blessed by your Jupiter in Capricorn, you have to make sure that you're living your own values and not anyone else's. Otherwise, basically, you end up climbing somebody else's mountain, and when you get to the top of it, it's like, I didn't even care about this. Why did I spend all that energy to get to the top of this mountain that I don't even care to be at the top of? Also, with Jupiter and Capricorn, you can get bogged down in the vision of the great work that you're trying to accomplish and forget about your own physical needs, the classic workaholic, which we have come to see from her. One of the one of the advices for Jupiter and Capricorn is to learn how to play in the mud when you're turning into too much of an adult. And this is an area that I don't know that she has cultivated this a whole lot. Um, she seems to take herself pretty seriously and if anything maybe works too hard like as Theranos was collapsing it seemed like her instinct was to try to grip it harder and get control of it and slip out from under the consequences and just keep going instead of ever taking like a real hard look at what are we really doing here are we living up to what we've promised next is her Venus in Capricorn Venus in Capricorn is a, again a very serious placement where Venus represents our sense of values, our ideas around what's important, um, the way that we love, the things that we love. Venus in Capricorn says, I am not willing to invest my energy in anything short of a masterpiece. And even then, a masterpiece inspired by my own heart. All of these Capricorn pieces are just like stacking up in a really weird opposition to this picture that she's currently painting in her defense of being this helpless little victim. It did say that for Venus and Capricorn, you're more likely to relax while working than sitting still. So again, that probably contributes to her workaholic nature. The shadow of Venus and Capricorn is that that's not a very loving energy. So you can tend to be overly critical and demanding of yourself and others, which I think at one point I read that she was having dinner catered to the office around 8 p.m. so that people would stay longer and work longer hours. And last but not least, Mercury in Capricorn. So Mercury represents our intellect, our thinking, our ability to turn what we know on the inside into a spoken expression. It also tells us how to keep the person mentally engaged. So Mercury in Capricorn means that the person needs a project. They need something to invest their thinking into that they can create, that they see value in, that they're inspired by. Again, similar to all of these other Capricorn pieces, the picture only works if your heart is in it. So that tells me the way that she worked at Theranos, like sun up to sun down, literally every day, seven days a week, didn't take a vacation, didn't take time off. We're talking like a decade and a half here. She clearly, her heart was in it. It was in it. It was like, I don't think we were wrong for believing her back in the day when she legit wants to revolutionize the healthcare industry. She wants to democratize preventative testing so that it's available and can help save people's lives. And now that she's jumped ship on that story and is more like, mm, I don't know what happened and he made me do it. I... <laughs> 
that's what sends me back to her Scorpio energy of like, is this just the face that she thinks will serve her best at her trial? And again, I don't know. I'm not sitting inside her brain. I know time will tell. I know we will get to see what she does next. And judging by her nail chart, I gotta say, like, I would almost put money on it that she will have a very similar scandal at some point in the future. Like, she'll just do it again. She'll just, like, have another idea and be a little too good at getting people to invest in her idea. And whether or not she can really do it or not, you know, like, again, time will tell. Again, with Mercury and Capricorn, it in indicates monumental self-discipline and self-control. And again, that points us back to her breaking down on the stand. Like, Mercury and Capricorn... I don't see breaking down on the stand. I don't see that in their DNA. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I could be wrong. If you have Mercury and Capricorn and you think you would cry on the stand, tell me in the comments. With Mercury and Capricorn, you are likely to make a lifelong commitment to something. Like decide with your heart what is worth me making a lifelong investment of my energy, my finite, precious, can't ever get it back, only have, you know, only forward. What is worth my energy? And we saw that with Theranos, that she was committed. I mean, I don't think anybody could ever say she wasn't committed to building building this technology. It was more how she chose to handle combining her vision into the right now reality and how she talked about it to investors who her side of it is that they should have done better due diligence, which is kind of shady all by itself. You know, these investors, they sued her because they felt like they were lied to. So you got to wonder, were they lied to? What did she really say? And why wasn't she more transparent about the current status of their technology? You know, right up until the end, she's talking about how her and Walgreens are rolling out so many more states and more stores are coming so fast and we're working so hard on it. And the technology like never actually worked. When will I have that opportunity in Washington or New York to go use a small test like that and find out data for myself? Working on it as fast as we can. I can <laughs> tell you our next states are underway. They're expanding and it's not even built. You gotta wonder like, how, why, why? Also for Mercury and Capricorn, it can lead to rigid communication and again, an inflated sense of self that leads one to be inappropriately authoritative. Meaning when she, like a 21, 22 year old woman is meeting with these old white rich dudes and she's able to just walk right in there and shake their hand. And like, she was all business. She was born to be all business. All of this Capricorn energy, they looked at her and it had instant respect. For her. And a lot of them signed on before there was ever any technology developed whatsoever, simply because of her. Her presence was so convincing, her tenacity, her clarity of vision. It was like she on the inside was already living her vision. Okay, the last piece that I'm going to add in here is Uranus and Sagittarius conjunct her south node. So South Node represents our past life karma, where the North Node represents our future life karma, the karma we're here to accrue in this lifetime. And Uranus is our revolutionary spirit, our fiery independence that wants to shake up the status quo, blow it apart, build something better in its place. And when you have, actually Uranus is also said to be a higher octave of Mercury, which like we said, represents intellect and thinking and higher, higher brain functions. So Uranus is also said to give you like flashes of inspiration, flashes of genius. And when you have Uranus conjunct the South Node, it's said to be a genius placement that like basically these souls have had lifetimes in previously well-developed societies like Atlantis which Atlantis, if you know the story, like, I don't know, I got this out of Dolores Cannon's books, but they were so advanced. They were working with dark matter and eventually like their civilization had to be sunk because they were about to blow up the earth and send unnecessary ripple effects out through the entire universe. So they basically had to go away and we started over as a civilization at that point. And so that's the 
the theory, if you want to subscribe to it, is that these people of Uranus conjunct south node that come along every few decades, they had lifetimes in these places and that they brought that intelligence with them. And it's really interesting to think about that in terms of her ideas towards blood testing and revolutionizing healthcare and how you know, she never did accomplish it. So it's easy to say like, was she just blowing smoke or she's crazy or she's just delusional or any of those things? I don't think she was. I think her vision and today's technology is just not quite up to date enough to support her vision. But if you watch this clip from this guy, you find out like maybe it's not as far off as you think. Wanted to change the way lab testing was done. If you're gonna start a company, the, the first question is why? Right. For me, it was, this is a change in the world that I want to see. The change was never realized, at least not by Theranos. Instead, the company imploded under a raft of lawsuits, regulatory actions, and SEC fines, all targeting Holmes for promising more than she could prove. The biggest concern I've had with the media was in, immediately after um, Theranos started falling apart, was there was a, a rumble of people saying, well, this was such a bad idea, this could never happen. Or actually, really, I think Elizabeth's vision uh, is, was phenomenal, right? And I, I share the same vision, and so I really resonate with that. I think it, it is a good idea, uh, and it needs to be, um, it needs to happen. So a little bit about Uranus and Sagittarius. This is, a, again, another generational planet. It moved into Sagittarius February 17th, 1981, and left to move to Capricorn on December 2nd, 1988. Uranus in Sagittarius is said to give the person a wise urgency on how short life is and that the only guarantee in life is death. So there is a sense of like hurry up and get to doing your purpose, whatever it is. And having Uranus and Sagittarius myself, I can definitely resonate with that. These people have a strong connection to their purpose from very early on, which like we've seen, she she seemed to just know that she was going to be walking this path. And so that Uranus and Sagittarius energy makes a lot of sense there. Uh, it makes you so that you're basically not preoccupied with normal human things. Like, doing your taxes or putting the registration sticker on your car. How mundane is that when you could be thinking about like your life's work and the legacy that you want to leave behind? So as you can see, it's not the most practical placement. Sagittarius is also like a really big picture energy. So Uranus and Sagittarius can get so consumed in the vision and have not enough of a grasp on the actual details of what's going on and how it's going to all come together. Again, you could almost say that this, while it absolutely catapulted her, the power of her vision and conviction and everything that she was able to create, but it also was basically a blind spot for her to be so consumed in the vision and living the vision that she was basically disconnected from reality and not realizing how serious it was that the technology was not working. The tools that you get with this placement, you have an innate faith in the meaning of life, that there is meaning to life and all things. It's not random. You have a definite ability to think for yourself and you're very open-minded, very open to other cultures and other perspectives, generally open and receiving to however anybody else wants to live. But at the same time, you're fiercely independent that you yourself will live according to whatever philosophy you personally come to. When you've landed on the shadow side of this energy, it leads to mindless rebellion. So like you're rebelling just to rebel. Like you have to say this just because somebody else already said this one. So that is pointless for the most part and obviously can lead you off into tangents that are just a giant waste of time. And basically you wind up confined by your own desire to be right and that you don't belong anywhere. Like you don't have a country. You feel very outcast from society as a whole. That's fine.
And last but not least, if you're not living your own individual path in with a Uranus and Sagittarius, you wind up bored out of your mind and highly resentful that there is no escape from this existence. Basically, you've lost touch with the meaning of your life. Your life is no longer worth living. And this is why I am positive that with or without her freedom, whether she goes to prison or she goes free, she won't sit still for long. Like she will be at it again. And basically that that's just how she's wired. She can't help herself. She's wired to build something monumental and she's wired to not sit still. She's wired to not let anybody else tell her what's right or wrong. She's wired to find her own individual soul's path. That conclusion leaves us with, you know, what do you guys think about her defense that she's the victim in all of this? Yet not everyone is convinced that Holmes was just a persuasive pretty face. This is going to sound a little strong, but to a certain degree she's a victim. Because she didn't know what she didn't know. And she relied on people who gave her bad advice or mismanaged it, I think. What do you think she's going to do next, like with her freedom? I'll bet you, I mean, whether it's blood testing or something different, I almost think it's going to be something different, but you know, time will tell and we will see. You almost have to wonder, like as much as it sucks that she lost her company and everything fell apart and all of that, but like, was it also a relief? Was it also like, like there had to be an end somewhere that eventually something was going to have to come along? And that's where, you know, all of that Scorpio energy is wanting her to face her own inner truth. And it took an indictment by a federal grand jury to get her to step out of her company when you got to wonder if there were moments along the way where she was aware that this is not working. Something I, she just kept trying to figure it out. And in the end, it, it didn't ever get figured out. But that's where I'm at with Elizabeth Holmes is I'm excited to see what she does next because I'm really hoping that it's not more of the same types of things go down for her. I hope, if anything, that she takes this experience and, you know, comes out with a, like, here's what not to do. <laughs> like, here, everyone, let's all learn from my mistakes. Like, honestly, she would have my full faith restored in her as a human being if she would write that book. So yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what kind of ownership she takes of this experience moving forward. Very interested to see how the trial plays out, how her cross-examination plays out, which is coming up very soon, or might even be started already. Who knows? <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it and subscribe to my channel. I do plan to do more videos like this, doing deep astrological dives into different people of celebrity status, people of influence. Maybe they did good things. Maybe they did bad things. We'll have to find out. Until next time, dear friends, you take good, good care of yourselves. And so will I.